so let's record this okay great okay um can you look through the waiting room then i would do yeah yeah if i if i see it yeah i would yeah all right um good morning everybody um so today we have mr eric solheim who is a norwegian diplomat and politician um, from 2005 to 2007, Mr. Solheim served as uh, Norway's Minister of International Development and from 2007 to 2012 held the combined portfolio of Minister of the Environment and International Development. Um, from a humanitarian point of view, it is very important to note that during his time as Minister, Norwegian aid reached 1%, the highest in the world. Uh, Mr. Solheim is an experienced peace negotiator, having acted as the main facilitator of the peace process in Sri Lanka from 1998 to 2005. This peace process led to a ceasefire and the Oslo Declaration in 2002, where parties welcomed the federal state in Sri Lanka. Unfortunately, in 2006, the war erupted in Sri Lanka and ended in 2009 with many tragic incidences. Apart from Sri Lanka, Mr. Solheim has contributed to peace processes in Sudan, Nepal, Myanmar and Burundi. Sri Lankan war has a global meaning from many different levels. It ran through the Cold War period to post-Cold War. It killed many thousands of civilians and killed many intellectuals and politicians, including an Indian Prime Minister and Sri Lankan President. This war can be examined from many different perspectives. An ethnic war, a class war, historical and territorial war, and so on. As a Sri Lankan myself, my life is closely intertwined with this war and subsequent challenges. In my experience as a humanitarian worker, there were two hopeful junctures in this war, which does not necessarily get mentioned in analysis. First was in 1996, when Sri Lanka won the Cricket World Cup. Both the LTT and government soldiers voluntarily celebrated this victory together. In 2004, soon after the tsunami, the LTT and government soldiers willingly came together to help affected populations. Unfortunately, these were missed opportunities, but also shows that common people do not want war. Mr. Solheim has kindly agreed to discuss of his experiences of the Sri Lankan peace process. As a Sri Lankan, I know that he did a thankless job and tried to bring two conflicting parties to negotiate. Although there was a lot of hope, there was also a lot of hatred within and outside of Sri Lanka. It is very important that we examine this experience from social, political, cultural and economic realities on the ground as well as global perspectives. The aim of this session is not necessarily to conduct a theoretical analysis of the Sri Lankan peace process from international humanitarian law or international human rights law. As students of humanitarian affairs, we need to understand that there is a huge difference between theory and practical realities. Without further ado, I invite Claudia to start this discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Janneke. Um, we're all sort of really excited to be able to have you here with us. So thank you so much for taking up the invitation. Um, so we'll do sort of a very similar structure to what we've done before, which is we'll just ask a series of questions to get the discussion going. But like uh, the main purpose is also to have sort of, um, you know, our students come in with questions and sort of um, really take um, advantage of sort of this opportunity. <clears throat> so, you know, the first question really is, more of an opening as we'd love to sort of to hear more of sort of your background as well um, and it's sort of you know please take us to the beginning of your experience and uh, what made you take up the job of mediator between the government of Sri Lanka and the liberation uh, tigers of Tamil and how did you find your purpose in this process knowing that it is a difficult and thankless task as sort of Janaka also pointed out Thank you so much, uh, uh, Claudia. You can hear me, I hope. Yeah. Good morning to everyone. Uh, the Norwegian involvement as the key facilitator of the peace process in Sri Lanka really started in 1998. Uh, then the, a delegation from the Tamil Tigers, uh, Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam, the LTTE, they came to my office. I was then in the Parliament of Norway and they asked a very simple question. Will Norway be ready to help get Mr. Anton Balasinga out of Sri Lanka, and that would be a startup of a peace process in Sri Lanka. Anton Balasinga was then the chief uh, 
uh, theorist, uh, the chief political advisor of the Tamil Tigers, the number two in the hierarchy, below Mr. Prabhakram, and he had um, uh, diabetes and his life was threatened and they wanted him to be brought out, but they wanted that as a start of the peace process. And uh, they came to me in the parliament as kind of a backup because they also, of course, went to the foreign minister and the minister of foreign affairs, but they were not sure that the people there would really grasp the uh, importance of this issue. So I spoke with our foreign minister of the time and we agreed we, we, should, we should take up this. And then we started a back and forth between the LTT uh, which was then had a small enclave in northern Sri Lanka, which were under their control, and the government led by President Shantika Kumaratunga. At the time, at the beginning, it was completely secret, absolute secret. In Colombo, there were two people who knew this, President uh, herself and Foreign Minister Lakshman Kadigama, her closest confidant. No one else, not even the Prime Minister was aware of what was going on. After two years, Shantika made it public, we went to see Mr. Prabhakram, the LTT leader up, up in the north, and the peace process really, really took off in a, in a kind of big, big way. You may ask, why did they come to Norway? I believe because we had some reputation at the time from the peace process in the Middle East. So it was seen as a dedicated peace broker. We were a far away country which cannot impose anything, <laughs> either the government or the LTT. So in that sense, we were a safe bet. We were very importantly at the end acceptable to India because India is the one and only neighbor of Sri Lanka, the overwhelming influence in Sri Lanka. Basically, Sri Lankans believe that if the sun happens to rise tomorrow morning, some way India must be behind, behind it. So uh, you cannot avoid India in, in Sri Lanka. And India did not want any major powers, say the United States or China, but not even European powers like the UK or France into their backyard. A small nation like Norway, which they could any time kick out if they wish, uh, was, was uh, acceptable. So that was how it started and how I became the chief negotiator, of course, working very closely uh, with the NF foreign minister or prime minister of Norway at, at the time. There were ups and downs. Uh, there was a very good start with the ceasefire agreement of 2001. For two or three years, there were no killings in Sri Lanka. Not one single person died in political violence, but it was many died before and after. And in 2002 in Oslo, the parties agreed on the Oslo Declaration, which said that they would explore uh, a federal uh, solution uh, to the conflict. Uh, after that, it gradually, as we heard, uh, came down. Um, the, after some time, the two parties decided in a small way, then in a big way, to go back to war, and it ended up in the uh, enormous massacres and, and death in 2009, where tens of thousands of Tamils, no one knows the exact number, died, civilians, uh, but also where the entire leadership of the Tamil Tigers uh, was wiped out. I'm not aware of any of the uh, 50 most important leaders of the Tigers of, of the time, who is still, uh, still uh, alive. What is the conflict about? Very briefly, Singhalese and Tamil are two completely separate languages. Singhalese is much more related to English than it is to Tamil. Tamil is a South Indian, Dravidian language, while right? Singhalese is a North Indian. The Singhalese tend to be Muslim, Buddhist, nearly all Singhalese are Buddhist, and there is a strong link between Singhalese language and Buddhism and nationalism and Sri Lankan nationalism. Tamils are normally Hindus, but there is also a substantial amount of Christians uh, among the Tamils. But religion was never at the core of the conflict. Language was really the issue distinguishing the two groups. Here to make it a lot more complicated, there are different groups of Tamils in Sri Lanka. You have the Jaffna or Northern Tamils, those who were in the conflict. Then you have the upcountry Indian or Tea Tamils, living in, coming much later, living in tea plantations in central Sri Lanka. And then you have the Muslims. Muslims in Sri Lanka normally speak Tamil, uh, so that Tamil by language, but their identity is defined by religion. So while Tamil identity is by language, Tamil language, Muslim identity is by religion, you are a Muslim. So that's this, all this complicated um, the issue. Uh, when did the conflict start? I believe it basically started in modern times in the 1950s. You find Tamils and Singhalese, you said they started back at the time of the Buddha, 2,500 years back. That in my view, that's completely nonsense. 
basically Tamils and Sinhalese were living peacefully together in Sri Lanka. They were separate, they didn't necessarily intermarry or there was not that much uh, uh, coming together, but they were living peacefully together in Sri Lanka for, for, for hundreds for thousands of years. However, in the 1950s, some politicians, for in my view, they have very narrow perspective, started a single only campaign. Sri Lanka had just been independent from, from the UK. It was independent separate from India because the Brits had made a separate administration for Sri Lanka. Otherwise, probably Sri Lanka would today have been part of India, like the enormous variety of different states and languages in India. They could for sure incorporate Sri Lanka as well. But it became a separate state. And in the early days of independence, some politicians said, let's go for a single only policy. Singhalese will be the only or the major language in the land. Tamil will have to find its second place. Of course, that was hardly agreeable to any Tamil. You want to, uh, if you want to bring in the police, you have to go through a language which you don't understand. If you send an application to the state, you have to write in a language you cannot understand. Was it was a recipe for disaster. Many people said two languages, one nation, one, na one language, two nations. And then gradually young Tamils picked up the fight in the beginning peacefully, later by violence. And from the 70s and particularly the 80s was a full-blown rebellion uh, with huge atrocities on both sides. In Sri Lanka, Basically, all killings were done by either the government of Sri Lanka or by the LTT. There were no freelancers. The good part of that was that whenever the two parties decided to stop violence, it stopped momentarily. The day after, there was no killings. However, of course, the bad part of it was that both the two parties were responsible for huge atrocities. The Tamil Tigers incredibly killed Archie Gandhi, the Prime Minister of India. I mean, how can we do I mean, such an evil thing, but also such a completely stupid thing? If you are a rebel movement in Mexico, we just start killing the president of the United States and make sure that you get the power of that nation against you. The Indians originally were very favorable to the Tamils, but of course, killing Raji Gandhi was an enormous political blunder. On the other hand, uh, the government of Sri Lanka also were killing a huge number of Tamil cadres of different sorts. And also, on numerous instances, they kill uh, people who were just opposed to the government, journalists, uh, others. So there was lots of atrocities, both on the government and the LTT side. I would be happy in the discussion to come back to the ups and downs of the peace process, why it failed, what we should have done differently, all this. But let me stop by this, when we stop with one story, mm -hmm. it's illustrated. When we started the peace process in Sri Lanka, I was invited to Delhi, uh, in the capital of India, and, the, and they basically asked, what in hell is this small, Christian, white, faraway nation doing here on the Indian subcontinent? You don't understand anything of this place. That was the uh, basically implied question. We were taken to the then, um, then uh, um, uh, chief, um, uh, chief bureaucrat of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, who made a two hours interrogation of us with any number of questions. But then we were taken to the foreign minister, Jaswan Singh of the BJP, the, the present ruling party, a Sikh. And he said, I have just one question for you. Are you patient? And I said, no, we are not patient. How can we? I mean, there are women dying in Sri Lanka every day. Young children are not getting education and they are bombed and killed. How can we pa be patient? And then just something said, uh, that's the way to Indira Gandhi International Airport. Please go there uh, uh, immediately and please make sure you have a one way ticket back to Europe <laughs> and never come back to the Indian subcontinent. Because if you have this perspective, you can never succeed. Only if you take a historical perspective of this conflict, it's long lasting, uh, a resolution will take time. If you can be in it for decades or for years and decades rather than for weeks, uh, you can maybe succeed. Even then, it will be difficult, he said. And of course, he was right. I was wrong. This is 20 years back, this conversation in Delhi. Today, still, the main problem in Sri Lanka is not resolved. And the main problem is, how can you make self-rule for the Tamils in the north and east of Sri Lanka? And how can you make Tamil not second class, 
that first class citizens of Sri Lanka on par with the Sinhalese in a joint state. Uh, we are not at a solution. There is peace in the land. There's no vi political violence, or, or at least not on a big scale in Sri Lanka now. Uh, so that's good. But this problem, which was the core of the conflict, which was there when we had the conversation with Just Fancy, is not resolved. It's still with us. That was a fantastic background. Thank you so much for that. And sort of just continuing on, you know, in, in terms of international human rights law and humanitarian law, what are the major strengths and challenges in establishing peace agreements between governments and non-state armed groups? And obviously to sort of drawing from your experience there. Yeah, obviously there are many aspects to that uh, question. Uh, one is the uh, lack of parallelity of the two, uh, of the two uh, entities. On one hand, you have a recognized government, uh, recognized by every other government in the world. Uh, and also elected by, through in, in case to Sri Lanka through free and fair elections. I mean, there were always some, some violence in the elections, but by and large, those who won the election, they won. On the other hand, you have a rebel group declaring that they are the sole representatives of the Tamil population in Sri Lanka and fighting by um, what many people will consider terrorist activities, uh, at least military activities against the state. So there are not, not a parallelity as much because in, in, in the direct sense, easier to make uh, the government responsible because they have huge number of international obligations, even if they do not respect them. Uh, our view during the peace process was that the main, main human rights problem in Sri Lanka is the war. Num number one, the war is a, a direct human rights problem because it causes a huge number of killings, suffering, and necessary violence. But secondly, war is also the excuse for every other violence. And if you, if you kill someone or harm someone or uh, recruit child soldiers uh, or uh, stop someone uh, having the right to express their opinion, the war was always the excuse. People on both sides saying, we have to do this to win this horrible, bloody conflict. So we took the view that you need uh, to stop the war, that, that's the most important issue. We employed Ian Martin. He was the former head of the Amnesty International and he had been the UN representative, special representative in a number of conflicts in East Timor. Later, he was in Nepal, other places. He was an extremely experienced uh, British uh, leader as a human rights advisor. And he came with advice as to say how to avoid child recruiting child, child soldiers or how to avoid the worst atrocities of the conflict. Uh, then comes the issue of the responsibility of the leaders on both sides. As I said, basically every single killing and every single human rights uh, violations in Sri Lanka uh, could be traced back to the leaders. Prabhakaran, the LTT leader, ordering the atrocities on the LTT side, and it was the top leaders of the state ordering the atrocities on the government side. That, of course, created the huge difficulty that if you want to bring these people to responsibility, if you even some, as some activist claimed, you need to bring them to Hague or to a judgment and things like that. It's very unlikely that you can bring the same people to a peace agreement and at the same time have the idea that they should be brought to court. Uh, this simply goes uh, counter purpose. You want to resolve the conflict you need to bring in exactly the same people which you want to hold responsible for the human rights uh, violations. And that's not an easy combination, which has been proven not just in Sri Lanka, but in numerous conflicts all over the, all over the world. So in, to make it very, very direct, we prioritized uh, to end the war because we felt, felt that was the main uh, human rights problem for the people of Sri Lanka. And we were ready to accept that if you want to bring a war to stop, you will not be able to make the uh, key people behind the atrocities. Um, uh, we will not be able to charge them or to hold them ac accountable for their, uh, for their misdeeds. Um, I mean, I'm just one final comment on that because 
people then speak to different uh, different uh, juridical process in, in for after the war in, in former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, of course the Nuremberg trials after the Second World War, where people tend to forget that all these came on the basis of one part winning and complete victory. I mean, there was not a compromise with, uh, with Nazism in 1945. Uh, it was not a compromise with Milosevic and his forces in the former Yugoslavia, and nor was it a compromise with the genocidal uh, government uh, of Mr. Bagasora in, in, uh, or his forces in, in, in Rwanda. It was an overwhelming victory of the Rwanda Patriotic Front of Mr. Kagame. On, on that basis, you could bring the uh, culprits on the government side to court. It was an overwhelming NATO victory in former Yugoslavia. On that basis, you can bring in Milosevic. And of course, thank God, uh, the Russians, Americans, and, and the rest of them won the Second World War. On that basis, you could bring Göring and all, and all the other uh, all the other Nazi uh, criminals to, to court. If you want a compromise, it's a very different situation. That's a really good sort of differentiation. Um, between that, thank you. And, you know, sort of you talk about the complexities of it and we wanted to sort of ask you about um, within the pre peace process, um, the other sort of, or the many external in interferences and if you can walk through uh, how sort of, um, how this was dealt with by the, you know, by the Norwegian peace facilitators and what practical suggestions can you share with us from your experience in dealing with these mm -hmm external interferences. Absolutely. This was, of course, a very different geopolitical situation from today. Number one, China played basically zero role. Uh, I, uh, I went to Beijing, I think, once during the entire peace process, and the Chinese was not very interested in Sri Lanka, and nor did we do anything to bring them in. The overwhelming influence, and now of course China is a major investor in Sri Lanka and in influencing events in Sri Lanka in, 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 a, in a big way. So leave China aside, they didn't play any role at that time. Secondly, India was the overwhelming influence in Sri Lanka, as I said. Remember that India and Sri Lanka is completely integrated in so many senses. It's the same food, same religions, same languages. I mean, Sinhalese is a Northern Indian language. Tamil is a southern Indian language. And uh, simply the way people look, you cannot distinguish anyone from Sri Lanka from, from, from Indians. It's absolutely the same culture, the same weather, the same food, the same everything. Uh, so, the, and India is, there is, I mean, of course, a few thousand years back, India and Sri Lanka was even connected. It was a land bridge, you could walk uh, from India to Sri Lanka. And if you, if you read the great Indian uh, Ramayana, so of course about the Indian god Ram, uh, his wife Sita is uh, kidnapped by the evil king of Sri Lanka and Hanuman, the ape king, monkey king, is bringing uh, the beautiful Sita back to India. So the integration here is enormous. And of course we took the view, India first, uh, you cannot achieve anything in Sri Lanka without India. So I went to India, I think every, every month or maybe every six weeks to keep the Indian intelligence and Indian political leaders. Uh, exposed to what's happening in Sri Lanka. Uh, third factor, United States. This was during the height of the, um, after 9-11, uh, the American campaigns against terrorism. On, per, on, with the words, they said, we can never negotiate with terrorists. The good news was that they were much more pragmatic in reality, led by then Deputy Foreign Minister Richard Armitage. Uh, he met with the Tamil Tigers in the back rooms in Oslo didn't want a photo of the event, but, uh, but he, he came and did it and gave them kind of the recognition in such a meeting. And the American support us throughout. We kept them informed, however, not at the same detail levels as, as with Indians. Finally, the European Union, that was a very difficult entity, I have to say, because you could not, could not trust the European Union. Uh, that was not because the leaders there were, were, were bad, but simply when you inform the Union, 27 nations had to be informed. They sent uh, updates to all capitals, and there would always be a leak somewhere. You could not keep anything secret. There was not, during the entire peace process, there was not one leak coming from Delhi or from Washington. Whatever we told Indians, whatever we told Americans, stayed with them. And we had absolute trust from both the Indians and Americans. 
but with the EU, if you send, if you told them, told one ambassador something, uh, another ambassador will leak it out, or we will go to to get some benefit from it. So we could not work very closely with the EU. Japan at then was also a major uh, influencer, mainly because they were financing uh, many development and peace efforts in Sri Lanka, and they also had a very good peace envoy, Mr. Koshi, who was the most high-ranking Japanese in the UN system, I think, ever. And he played a key role. So to sum up, we brought all these key powers in to support the peace process. They were all supportive. And we know now for sure that that was not just what they said, because the, the WikiLeaks papers, we could read all the reports from the American embassy in Colombo to, to Washington and vice versa. And exactly what they told us, they also told the uh, the, the, the peers and the, the Colombo embassy sent always 100% supportive messages about our Norwegian efforts to, uh, to Washington. So China at the time was not relevant. India was the main issue. The United States was the second issue. And others were important, but not as important as India and the United States. And in that sort of what was some of the would you describe as being sort of some of the strengths and weaknesses of the Sri Lankan peace process and what went right and what influenced the failures? So I know kind of we've briefly touched on that, but. I think there were two main weaknesses. I mean, we can mention more, but two, which was the absolute most significant. One was that the LTT, the Tamil Tigers, of course, was not a democratic movement. It was led by one man, he had formed the movement, they recruited at the end all the leaders, that was Mr. Prabhakaran. He started in 1975 by then killing the, the then mayor of, of Jaffna, uh, who, which was a Tamil traitor for the, the cause, and he built up the movement. And all the top military leaders of the LTT had been recruited by Prabhakaran, they tended to be about 10 years younger than him. So, of course, he was the total dominant political leader and military leader of the movement. He had Anton Balasingam, who was based in London during most of the peace process and later sometimes in Sri Lanka, he was a great influence. If the LTT had followed Balasingam, uh, they would still have been alive. Sri Lanka would have been a completely different place. He gave the right advice. The Pravakran, uh, he wanted the peace process. He started the peace process when he was at the top of his strength, uh, which was remarkable because they were very, very strong at the, at, at the time. They had been close to wiping out the entire Sri Lankan army from the north. And then was when he started the peace process. Obviously, he wanted peace. But at the end, he could not really embrace federalism. Uh, he said by verse that he would explore federalism. Uh, but I think it went contrary to his instincts. He didn't like federalism. And at the end, federalism was the only negotiated settlement. Uh, uh, all out victory for the Tigers could bring a separate state. All out victory for the government could bring a unitary government from Colombo, but on the compromise was federalism. And remind yourself, India is federal, Germany is federal, uh, Spain is federal, uh, England, uh, UK is also to some extent federal. Uh, so there's federalism as a functioning system, so many other places in the world. So we tried to uh, bring everyone on board for federalism. And, but Prabhakaran couldn't do it, and we didn't simply have enough time with him. I think this was a major mistake. We should have spent a lot more time with him. But the government wanted to restrict our time and the time of others with Prabhakaran because they didn't want to give him that recognition. I believe we should have made many more envoys from the European Union, um, from the United States, from the UK, wherever. They should have gone, spoken to Prabhakaran and tried to uh, tell him how the world looked like. Was it may be incredible, but he was a fantastic, brilliant military leader for very long with an enormous success given his resources. I mean, a military genius, <clears throat> but his knowledge of the world was very limited. He had hardly been to the south of Sri Lanka. He had never been outside southern, outside India and Sri Lanka. Well, once he went, for a piece, went to Bhutan, maybe, but basically had only been to India and Sri Lanka. They didn't understand the world. They had no idea what the world looked like from Washington, not, not even from, from Delhi. So in that sense, it was a complete political amateur. So this was the one obstacle to bring Prabhakaran and then the LTT on board for federalism. The other obstacle was that in Colombo, there were two main Sinhalese parties, the time United National Party and the Sri Lanka Freedom Party. 
during most of the peace process, the president from, from the Sri Lanka Freedom Party, the prime minister for the United National Parties, and they fought each other tooth and nail. Uh, at then, very often we felt that they are more they are more hate, have more hatred for each other than for the tigers, uh, and that that meant that it was very very difficult to get any solution from Colombo. And the LTT felt, how, how can we trust in the solution from Colombo? Because if we make an agreement with the one party, the other party will oppose it. There may be a referendum, and then the other party will not referendum will oppose it, and we may not get what we agreed to in talks. Uh, can these could these two issues of Prabhakra and the lack of unity in Colombo could have been resolved? Uh, not by the Norwegians. Maybe the Indians could have done more to bring the two parties in Colombo together. Maybe others could have done that. It was not easy, but maybe it could have happened. But then you would have someone with much more power to simply push them together. Uh, and we should have been allowed to spend a lot more time with Prabhakar to convince him that at the end you need to go for federalism. You cannot win a war because the Indians will not allow you to win. At the end, the Americans will may not intervene, but they will also pop up the government if you are on the verge of winning, so you, you cannot win. Why not compromise where you get 70% of what you want, which is you will be the king of the north, uh, Prabhakran would have been the chief minister of the north, uh, but uh, you will not have a separate state. Mm -mm. And thank you. And um, what are some of the requirements of becoming a peace facilitator or negotiator and how do third parties get invited? Yeah, as I said, we were invited, I believe, in Sri Lanka because it was a small, small, far away party which could not really enforce anything. So we were a safe bet. Uh, we were acceptable to India, which no bigger party could have been. We brought in a, a Sri Lanka monitoring mission and I had long discussions with the Indians so as to what nations could be part of that. And at the end of the day, the Indians will only accept small. Mm -hmm. uh, Christian nor, nor, uh, European nations like Norway and Sweden and small African nations like say Namibia. Not even the Netherlands was acceptable to, to, uh, to India because the Netherlands had a colonial past uh, in South Asia and they didn't want to bring them in even if the Netherlands is not a major power of the, of the, of the world uh, today. So this, the, the, the far away small uh, size of Norway was a key factor. And of course, the personal trust to be established after some time is critical. It's not just about nations, it's also about people. And we never lied to the parties. Uh, we never went behind the back. Uh, so they started trusting us. India trusted us and they trusted us. Um, what are the requirements of peace negotiators? I think the number one is patience and, uh, and the fact that you have two ears and one mouth. You, you need to listen. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, I sat for days, weeks, listening to say, the LTT perspective of the world. You got a little bit tired hearing that the uh, government of Sank had been evil uh, throughout history and on all occasions, and they had always tried to cheat them. Uh, and of course, you got the exact opposite perspective from the other side. But you need to listen. You need to try to understand their concerns, because at the end, peace can, cannot be enforced from outside. Development cannot happen from outside either. You can only be there to help. And then I think the ability to listen and always look for a compromise. Then people would ask, how can you sit down, have coffee and tea, even meals with these people, which you know are killing a lot of people and many people who see them as evil. When I always took the perspective but what are the interests of the victims, all those killed? And I think the interest of the victims is exactly that. You need to talk to them. I mean, two weeks back, the Norwegian government in, invited a, a delegation from Taliban uh, in Afghanistan uh, to sit down in Oslo with Norway, but also with the United States, EU, mm -hmm. and others. Exactly the right thing to do. I mean, I don't like the Taliban, of course, absolutely not. But mm -hmm. they will be in power for the next 10 years in Afghanistan, maybe for the next 50 years in Afghanistan. What do we want? Well, at least that they make a little bit less uh, aggressive policy against uh, women's education. We want Afghan girls to get to school, even if it will not be a feminist paradise in Afghanistan and the Taliban. Everyone understand that, but it may be a little bit less bad. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
for that reason. And that's the perspective of the victims, those uh, who are suffering. You need to talk even to the guys who you know may order a killing just after you have left the room. Mm -hmm. And in, in that sort of, you know, discussing sort of about those requirements of sort of becoming a peace facilitator, why do you think there's sort of an absence of women as peace negotiators and facilitators in global platforms? And, you know, that's just sort of more of a general question of sort of what are some of those challenges within um, women taking up those roles? That is a very interesting question, and I tried to answer it myself because uh, to the extent that you can say that there are some archetypical abilities of women and men, uh, you would think that women tend to be better on compromise. Uh, it's not always like that, but it's very often in a family, the mother or the woman, you create the compromise and bring people together, while men historically had tended to be more aggressive, of course, also because of the role in, uh, in the hunter, uh, <coughs> hunting society of the past. The man was the hunter, the um, woman was the person keeping the family together. So overall, you would think women should be the right peace negotiator. There is hardly any woman who has played the key role in any peace process. Yes, some civil society activists have tried to help peace, but at the inner core, those uh, are in the inner room to make peace very, very, very rare with any women. In Sri Lanka peace process, there were only two women who played any role. One was, of course, Chandrika Kumaratunga, president of Sri Lanka. She was a brilliant woman, but of course, she could, she could hardly have become the president unless being the daughter of two former prime minister. Her father was the prime minister, her mother was the first uh, head of state of any uh, head, head, first women head of state to any government in, in, in the world, Mr. Mrs. And Mr. Bandra Naike. But she was, she was there, and the wife of Mr. Bala Singham, uh, Adele, Australian by birth, uh, lived still today living in the United Kingdom, she was also a substantial influence. But there were, she was the only woman <laughs> in the inner circle with, and the president uh, overwhelming influence, so there were very few women. Uh, today, still, I think peace, make, peace negotiations is one of the most male-dominated activities on planet Earth. On par, maybe, with CEOs so multilateral companies. There are not many women CEOs of so Alibaba or, um, uh, or Microsoft or Google still. Uh, there are some, but not many. So I, I cannot explain it, but it's a reality. Thank you. Um, and I will just sort of like a call on Janneke to sort of, I think, begin with sort of um, getting our students to sort of ask some questions and, and sort of just open the floor up to sort of a few, um, maybe 10 minutes of discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like, I mean, um, as Mr. Solheim said, like, I mean, the Sri Lankan situation has been always a complex, um, complicated situation. And I think, um, there are two points I would like to a little bit elaborate uh, further. Is one, um, Mr. Uh, or Dr. Anton Balsingham played like I mean he was the only one within the LTTE who understood the the southern Sri Lanka. He spoke Sinhalese. He had Sinhalese friends, so he knew the Sinhalese psyche. And unfortunately, Mr. Prabhakaran who never had that opportunity. So he didn't know Singhalese um, in, in close connection. And then the, the government side, which is the, the president of Sri Lanka at that time, Mrs. Kumar Tunga, and the prime minister, uh, Mr. Vikrama Singh. What is really interesting is, and these were like a lot of uh, Marxists uh, try to analyze the Sri Lankan war from a class point of view. They were from the same class. They were actually um, related to each other. They, they, they were supposed to be friends. They went to school together. They, were, they grew up together, yet they couldn't come together in a very important um, time of Sri Lanka. So in that, um, I would like to um, 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 ask Ryan, he had his hand up. Um, so you want to ask a question? Yes. Uh, good morning to everyone. It was really interesting to hear. Um, I've, I come from Malaysia, so there was a lot of news about it as I was growing up, but never at, 
add knowledge about this experience after listening to, to you. Um, my question to, to Eric is that <clears throat> uh, earlier on, you said that there was a decision made to not prosecute the perpetrators of this, of this war uh, to bring peace or to end the war. Uh, my question is that how does the legislation or the peacekeeper decide in compliance to IHL or international humanitarian rights law? Because uh, clearly that in order to achieve something, we cannot, you know, cannot put someone who's responsible, we cannot uh, charge someone who's responsible for the war um, to bring a greater goods. How does that thought process come into situation? We can expand a bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, we, we could not <clears throat> give any guarantee uh, against future prosecution. We could only uh, tell the parties that we would do our utmost to avoid that. Uh, we could also speak against it in media and tell the people why that would be counterproductive. Because if you want to bring Prabhakaran to peace, at the end, you will have to make him the chief minister of the north or a top position. And then you cannot prosecute him for his crimes. And if you want to bring the president of Sri Lanka uh, into a peaceful situation, of course, you cannot uh, envisage that she, she, she should or he later should be, uh, later be brought to Hague. That's, that's counterproductive. We could not give any guarantees, but we could tell them that we will do our utmost. And when we make a final peace agreement, of course, we will bring in, in one way India or the United States and others as guarantors for this peace. And they will then uh, also make sure that nothing of this sort uh, will happen. It was not a major issue, but it, it was an issue. We also mentioned that because Malaysia played some uh, small role in the peace process, uh, uh, there is a substantial Tamil group in, in, uh, in Malaysia. Uh, I think the wife of, uh, <coughs> um, of um, the, the, the uh, uh, Mr. Karuna, who was the uh, defector from uh, the LTT and played a key role because he was the leader of the LTT in the, in the East when he defected from the LTT, uh, it strongly uh, reduced the strength of the LTT and it made it possible for the, for the government to retake the entire East. And his wife, I think, was in, in uh, Malaysia and that played some role. And at the end also, at the last part, last part of the peace process, <clears throat> the, the, the LTT had appointed a, a chief kind of foreign minister for the, for the agreement, and he was basically in, in Malaysia and, uh, and Singapore. And we wanted to bring him to Oslo to agree to a negotiated settlement at the end of the war, so that the LTT should allow all the civilian Tamils and also their own cadres to, uh, to, to stay safe. And the Indians or the Americans or the UN would pick them up by, by a ship. So that we negotiated very strongly with him, and he was then based in Malaysia and, and Singapore. Thank you for that. Really appreciate it. Okay. Um, so there's a question in the, the chat room um, by Rosie. Um, sorry, it is quite noisy where I am. My question is In your experience of peace negotiating, how helpful is bringing up that international laws have been broken? Um, do the sides take seriously the potential prosecutions? Um, I imagine it would differ between sides. Yeah, absolutely. Um... Well, uh, it was not a major issue in Sri Lanka. The major issue was always the conflicts of the day, the recent killings, what, how they could be stopped, how we could find a settlement to the to the fed, federal uh, issue in Sri Lanka. So it was not was not a key issue. It was not a top priority issue, but it it was was an issue. Um, we tried, of course, mainly to reduce uh, all sorts of human rights abuses uh, which were happening. If there were if there were killings or abductions, we tried to help out. Um, uh, the, a major issue was child, uh, child soldiers because they ultimately recruited very young um, uh, youngsters into the movement. They claimed that these were, many of them had lost their parents and this was a good way of taking care of them. Uh, but they, they were they were young and they were, were below. Uh, the age of 18, which uh, is kind of generally accepted internationally. And then, of course, they pointed to different nations like the United States who allow 17 or uh, young into, in, into the army. 
Uh, so we tried to try to put a stop to the use of both child soldiers. These were the top uh, human rights issues at the time. Okay, um, so I have a question. Um, I think like um, for the students, this would be a useful one because um, as students of humanitarian affairs is um, that as I mentioned, like, I mean, um, you are subjected to many hate campaigns and people like I'm especially in the southern Sri Lanka, a lot of people hated you. Um, and how you dealt with that as a person, as an individual? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> first of all, uh, we were not really scared for the main reason that we knew that uh, the two parties were behind us. And the LTT didn't want to harm us, nor did the government of Sri Lanka want to harm us. Of course, in the later days, we got a more strange relationship to the, to the, uh, to the, the present, um, uh, present uh, leadership, the Rajapaksas, but we had not the slightest uh, fear that they would try to harm us in any way. And since nearly all killings in Sri Lanka are, uh, uh, were ordered by either side, so we were not really scared of that. So what we were sometimes scared of was some to say, lunatics, I mean, which can happen in a war situation that individuals simply go, go crazy, that it's not ordered by the, structure, the military structures of the two sides, but lunatics. So, of course, there was a huge uh, security detail whenever I traveled in Sri Lanka, I had a huge number of security personnel, but I didn't really feel threatened. Um, the anti-Norwegian agitation over time became problematic, and I think it originated in the fact that we were basically the only people speaking to the Tigers. So whenever people in southern Sri Lanka saw Prabhakaran on TV, they would see him in a company, company by me or by some other, other Norwegian. So they get the impression by this picture that we were very, very close to the Tigers. It did never undermine our trust with Rani Vikram Singh or Shandika Kumaratunga. We felt we had the complete support uh, throughout. But it undermined to some extent our credibility uh, with, 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 uh, with uh, say, the, uh, the anti peace nationalist uh, group or sentiment in the, in the Singala community. Interestingly, after the war, uh, uh, has been closed. Uh, some Tamil extremists are now uh, making the same agitation against me and, and Norway as the single extremists did in the past, claiming that I'm personally responsible uh, for the demise of the Tigers and for the killing of Prabhakaran. So now we have both Tamil and single extremists basically blaming Norway, but I still believe that the vast majority, both the Singhalese and the Tamils, uh, believe that we did our best. We, we were not able to force an peace in Sri Lanka, but we, uh, we did, did, did our best. There were posters <laughs> all over Colombo. Uh, with pictures of David Milburn, who was then the UK foreign minister, and, and Hillary Clinton, who was the US foreign minister, and myself, uh, saying these are the terrorists, these are the supporters of terrorists. So it was, it was ugly, uh, but it, it never cause deviated us from from the main issue, which was to bring the two parties together. Yeah, I, think I think every 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 peacemaker in the world have to be ex have to accept this. If you can't accept it, you must find another business. No, I think it's an important point uh, from a learning um, perspective because um, um, if if Sri Lankan peace process was successful, nobody would be talking about Mr. Solheim or Nove today. And probably Mr. Prabhakaran and the president of Sri Lanka have won the Peace Prize and all of the Nobel Peace Prize and all of that. So if it was a successful process, the peace negotiator disappear. You don't see them. But then if it was a, an unsuccessful process, that's where the, 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 the blame comes and, and all the other challenges comes in. So that's something for you all to think about, like if you are involving in negotiating, even at a community level in a conflict situation, that's the, that's the, the case. So in that, um, Erika got a question? Yeah, I mean, just add one point there, I think. One one uh, step we should have taken, which we didn't take to abate this to some extent, was to be closer to the Buddhist clergy, uh, the so-called Mahanaikis. Those are the Buddhist leaders in Kandy in the central uh, Sri Lankan town, but they have had huge influence. And 
by and large, uh, the top Buddhist leaders were skeptical or opposed to the peace process because they they were kind of the embodiment of the time, the Sinhalese Buddhist uh, national feelings. However, they were not uh, against talking. They always received us when we went there, but we were strongly advised by President Shandika Kumara not to go there. Uh, but I think we should have done a lot more to reach out and to see how we could have a dialogue with the Buddhist leaders, because they would have been able to speak to their supporters and uh, and maybe at least they would not have may have not have been core supporters of the peace process, but they may have reduced this hate propaganda uh, somewhat if they had been more uh, uh, outreaching to them. Yeah, Erika, go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Um, just uh, you had mentioned earlier about um, you know kind of choosing or prioritizing the peace process over um, the holding holding people accountable for their war crimes, um, and I'd imagine that's a very difficult uh, difficult seat to be in uh, morally. So, um, having served in Afghanistan as part of the Canadian military, certainly we had our fair share of having to kind of at least talk with warlords to be able to access. Um, you know, certain territories and things. So, and we've, we've, we've talked about this in our course before um, about the morality of this. So my, or my, my, I guess my question to you is what would your advice be to humanitarians who find themselves morally in this position, uh, struggling morally with, you know, I have to deal with these people who I know are, you know, have committed crimes against humanity, but in order to the end state, like you said, always keeping that vision of what's what the victim's interest at heart. But is there any practical, really great tips you have for people in that in that really difficult moral seat? I think you should then constantly asking yourself, what would the victims of this war want me to do? Would they want me to confront uh, the penetrators of violence and uh, crimes? Or would they want me to reach out to them, to discuss with them, to find solutions to reduce the problems? In most cases, people will want you to reach out. Because even with the most evil people, sometimes important minor victories have been won. I mean, a substantial amount of the Jews in Hungary were saved during the Second World War because they at the end reached out to the, the Germans to find uh, some way of, of saving them. And later, the Swedish uh, diplomat who did this, Mr. Wallenberg, has been holed up as I mean, was later killed by Stalin, but he was, uh, uh, it was uh, doing something very, very dangerous, very, very difficult, of course, you can criticize it from a moral perspective that it may have saved hundreds of thousands of people's life and people that can go after the second world, go, go forward and uh, make families uh, and go about with their lives. Uh, this issue came up just in Norway two weeks ago when uh, the Norwegian government invited Taliban here. One part of that group was Mr. Hakani, the younger brother of the leader of the Hakani network. Uh, Hakani network is, uh, is seen as a terrorist network by the US and most, most others and they have made many crimes. Uh, the Hakan network may even be, have been responsible for an attack of the Serena Hotel in Kabul when my good friend, now Norwegian Prime Minister, Jonas Kastori was there. It was not related to that, but it killed one Norwegian journalist at the time. So would you want this kind of network to speak to this kind of network? Well, my answer is yes. Uh, Mr. Connie is not uh, my buddy, uh, maybe not the type I would want to go have a beer with. However, he has a lot of power in, in today's Afghanistan. And we do want girls to get education in Afghanistan. We do want uh, uh, Taliban to live in peace, all those who worked with the previous government. Uh, we want uh, to bring aid to Afghanistan so that people are not starving and children are dying from hunger. And if we want all this to happen, well, we have to do the uh, somewhat difficult task of speaking to people who are not of a cup of tea. So I will normally, and nearly all circumstances, be on the side of those who say, yes, please go ahead, please speak, please find, try to find compromises, even if uh, you have to do difficult work. 
So uh, what, what, how did, what, did, what did you do in Afghanistan at the time? Where were you based? Uh, I've been, uh, well, I've spent a total of, uh, what, I guess, 18 months there, oh, a little bit less. Okay. Yes, yeah. so I've been several times. So uh, I, one of the tours is up in Kabul, which was uh, different, <laughs> more, more, more on the, not quite fully engaged in the conflict yet. And the others were down south in Kandahar, which were full combat. Uh, yeah. yeah. And what did you do? Did you speak? Did you reach out to warlords? We had to. I, I'm. Uh, I was an explosive ordnance disposal uh, operator, so uh, we were collecting old ordnance from the villages, um, and you know that we weren't allowed. We weren't allowed in. So. At some point, we had to. We had to speak to them and and ask their permission um, to go in and and you know take all the ordinance away and explain what we were doing and explain when you hear big booms, it's on purpose. We were getting rid of the ordinance and that sort of thing. Um, but it kind of all had to be delivered in the in the uh, in a very from a place of humility and a place of um, you know asking permission. Uh, I'm not here, you know. I'm asking you if I can do this. Uh, we had to kind of deliver the respect, even though we knew we were dealing with people who had uh, committed horrible crimes, particularly against women and girls. So that was a very challenging situation for me. We also have, I mean, unfortunately to take the perspective that we're also speaking to a lot of leaders from decent nations who have committed big crimes. Uh, Lyndon B. Johnson was a brilliant president of the United States of America domestically. He was the man behind the uh, social uplifting of poor Americans. But he was also the key person in a war which killed three million Vietnamese for absolutely no purpose. The outcome in Vietnam was exactly the same in 1975, which is had been in 1955 if the Americans had allowed elections in Vietnam. Elections in Vietnam in 1955 would have brought Ho Chi Minh to power. And elect, or the lack of election and the takeover of North uh, of the Northern Vietnamese in 1975 was brought the same people to power. Uh, but and I could give any number of more recent examples of political leaders in decent nations who have committed at least, I mean, the stupidity of the Iraq war, uh, killing hundreds of thousands again for no purpose, reducing American power, making the Middle East less stable. It's of course also a crime. Uh, whether it should be punished is another another side, but we we are we are we are relating to a huge number of international leaders who make stupid, sometimes criminal decisions. Okay. Ryan, you got a question? Yeah, um, it was an extension to Erica's question, but also you brought up really interesting point about dealing with these nations' position. Because my question is that. With your work experience, I'm sure you had to deal with a lot of uh, countries leaders and a lot of it, I must sure have some political inclination into a crisis, like they have political importance into an area of a crisis. How does upholding the right to, to the IHLs or IHFL and also to, to greater goods you know, because I feel like if we're not addressing the offenses created by all these people around the world, we're going to go back in the cycle because someone, some other belligerents are going to look like, oh, that country does it. They are not punished. We can do the same. You know, how does how does being being international leaders help, you know, navigate those kind of challenges in this uh, law or bodies here? Because I, I take a somewhat optimistic perspective because maybe my, my main interest in, in is history and contrary to what most people believe, because we are in the most peaceful time of human history. There's much less violence today than at any other point in, in human history. If I walk the streets of Oslo today, the chance of being murdered is about 10% of what the chance of being murdered in Oslo would have been, uh, say, in the year 1400. Uh, uh, the chance of getting into any sort of violence, I mean, domestic violence, which is horrible all over the planet. I mean, basically men killing or, or harming their wives, street violence, terrorism, um, uh, wars, uh, is, um, uh, is much less than at any point in human history. There are much fewer wars. So overall, there are good reasons to believe that we are moving in the right direction. 
because there is, a, there is less to win from wars than there was in the past. And come back to that if you wish, much less. Uh, there, so there are less reasons for, his, for leaders to start them. It's more of an international ideology against wars. You have different systems to avoid wars, negotiators, etc. Uh, and we have the value of the individual is much higher, also because nearly all parents in the world now have only two children. There are some nations in Africa where it's much higher, but say in India, which is such an enormously populated, populated nation, the average women in India now get two children. If you have only two children, you value the children and you really don't want to send them into a war because then if you lose these two children, well, you have no pension in India. You are so, and that, and that's just an example. In Malaysia, I guess the birth rate is more or less the same as in India and Norway, which is around two. So uh, I believe that we are in a much, much more favorable situation and we can gradually reduce, uh, the, reduce uh, war and conflicts uh, if, we, if, we, if we keep up all these reasons to ha have less wars. Uh, people may ask, why? why is there less to win? Let me get, make that point. Let's, let's assume that China became so extremely powerful that it could attack, say, California. In the past, there would have been a lot to win. Because in the past, it was all about keeping land. Now, what you, if you could occupy California, well, you will get some wine ranks. <laughs> you will get a beautiful piece of land. But obviously, the real value in California, what is that? Well, that's Google. <laughs> that's Amazon or the well, state of Washington. But that's what uh, the value of the East Coast. That's Apple. And obviously, Apple and Google will disappear from, from California the one day the Chinese were attacking and move, and move somewhere else. So the value in today is not in keeping land. It's about power in international processes, the power in international trade, economic power in so many other ways. By the way, China has been enormously successful over the last 40 years because they kept peace. China has not been, in, been involved in any war since 1978, where they crazily, uh, crazily attacked the Viet Vietnam. Since that, they stayed out of every single war. The United States has been involved in basically every war since. Russia has been involved in many wars. And we have to admit, the Europeans have also been involved in quite a number of wars. So, so how wise the Chinese have been, and the economic rise of China is, of course, due to the fact that they stay out of wars. One day, China started being involved in a huge number of wars, they will waste the resources of wars rather than prioritizing the economic development. And of course, the economic development of China, which has made China now a global power, not yet on par with the United States, but still with any comparison, the second biggest power in the world. And this rise of China could never happen if China started involving in wars in Libya and Afghanistan and, and Iraq and, and Ukraine and you name all the places. Simply because they stay out of that, that they can have been able to rise up that fast. Yeah, it may, may not have been a proper answer to the, your question, but still it was some, some comment. Just one final thing on, on the top leaders. Uh, you need to make personal relations. And that makes also the question of, how to link up with people even more complicated because if you want to speak to Prabhakaran, well, you need to be personal, which meant having a huge number of meals with him, trying to get the atmosphere. We, what we tried to do from the Norwegian side, was maybe go for a walk, speak a little bit about his wife, speaking about his main passions like uh, cinema. It was a great, it was a great interest in films. You try to get under the skin of the person. And uh, what people, people's interest differs. Some male leaders are very interested in the wives and want to talk about the wives, some don't. <laughs> they want to speak about the mistresses or something else. Some are interested in sports, soccer, some are not. Uh, some are interested in cricket in South Asia, some are not. Uh, some are interested in food or nature or photography. I mean, you, but you need to try to touch the humanity, even of the people who are culprits or, or major. Uh, major uh, violations of, uh, of uh, human dignity. That difficult, uh, but uh, it's important. I may have learned it the highways, uh, 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 learned it the, uh, uh, from from the beginning. I, I still recall the first conversation I had with them, uh, Foreign Minister Sri Lanka, Mr. Hamid. He was a very small man, 150 tall. He was a Muslim. But he was a giant of Sri Lankan politics. 
and I asked him, what is foreign policy all about? And I expect him to speak about the nation building, economy, trade. And he said, foreign policy is all about human relations, personal contacts. And then he embarked upon a long, long uh, speech about how, how close he was to Fidel Castro of Cuba, uh, telling me that Fidel Castro, knowing that he was a Muslim, while Castro was from a Christian nation, even for Christmas every year sent him cigars to this Muslim. And his cigars, he claimed that Castro had played some role in packing himself, may or not, may not be true. But these personal bonds are key uh, in international diplomacy and people tend to underestimate them. Sorry for a long answer. No, I think, it's, yeah, it's, it's very um, important because like, I mean, especially if you think like, not at the, the, the high level of peace negotiations, but even as a local humanitarian worker in a, in a refugee camp or, or in, a, in a conflict um, situation, that you need to understand that you are negotiating, you are engaging with different types of people. And I think, especially at a, at a community level, or even in, if I talk about the Sri Lankan context, it's very easy to get mesmerized by these leaders. I mean, I remember um, so many international and national human right, humanitarian workers getting mesmerized by um, someone like Tamil Selvan, who used to be the head of the political wing of the LTT because he was very charming, he knew how to talk and all of that. So most humanitarian workers who go to talk to him about humanitarian access would come out with a good discussion, but without any results. So you need to understand if you are a, if you are negotiating for a certain um, um, a situation, you need to make sure that you achieve what you want to achieve, and and that near that needs to be understood within that human relationship, human context. These are humans. Um, even someone like Mr. Prabhakar, who loved cooking, who had a family, who loved his children, and all of that, suddenly. He, you can't like really separate the guerrilla leader who killed many people from that father or the husband so that's where the the human side comes in um let, let in me that, just um, shop in here I'll give you a couple of examples i mean uh, we try to help sure. and also on the also on the personal level uh, he had a daughter i mean all his three children also died in the end of the war so it was not just him his entire family was was killed but he had a daughter and the daughter wanted to get education outside Sri Lanka. So I went to Dublin uh, to get her into university there. And the Irish said, yes, we will, we will make no difficulty with her because of her father, even if we don't agree with the father, I mean, she should not be responsible for her father. So we will accept her into any of our universities and we'll also accept her mother to come and stay with her. Uh, for a, a period and make no no visa or any difficulty with, with that. That was very helpful. Unfortunately, it didn't work out because then they, they went back to war, so she couldn't come out. But these kind of give, making personal help to people uh, also help. The one hero, in my view, of the peace process was Mr. Balasengam, as you mentioned. He, we were very close. He was based in London. Normal pattern was I would go once a week to, to London. Uh, we would chat for a couple of hours in his home. And then we would go out and have either extremely hot Indian or extremely hot Chinese food. He would never ever touch European food, not, <laughs> not at all. Either strong, strong, hot Indian or Chinese uh, food. But because we, and then we would have white wine, he loaded a white wine even for lunch. Um, so he drank a, a lot of uh, Chardonnay. Uh, but this was his way of relaxing and we became very, very close through this process. And he gave all the right advice to Prabhakar to go for federalism, to not go back to war. And he even said that we LTT may lose the East if we go back to war, and we may even lose the North if we go back to war. And that was exactly what happened after Balasingham died in 2006. So he, fortunately, he was not able to see this complete destruction of the LTT. We see, uh, warned against so ryan you got the the final question yeah i i i'm sorry this this conversation about human psyche just got me so intrigued about this my question is not about the peace it's not about the rule but about the human aspect of all this 
Mr. Soham, I, I'm curious to know, because you've worked with so many crises, so many wars, I've seen so many atrocities, how do you take care of your soul, who you are as a human being? I'm, I'm really curious because it gets me goosebumps thinking about it. How do you stay so composed after witnessing and having to work around so many of these difficulties in, in human nature? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very good question for sure. Um, of course, in Sri Lanka, so many people which we, we were very close to died. As I said, all the LTT leaders uh, <clears throat> died at the end of the war and were, or were killed. Um, Mr. Puli Devan, he was a very close friend. He was the head of the peace secretariat. He, <clears throat> he called us on the last day of his life and telling us that he wanted to, to surrender to the Sri Lankan government and whether we could help him. That was too late for us to help, but we told him to surrender with a big white flag. Uh, and the day after he was killed uh, with Mr. Nadesan, the leader of the political wing of the Tigers. And in all likelihood, they were killed in the meaning that they were taken hostage and then killed by the Sri Lankan army, which is, of course, a war, war crime. But they were people very close to, to me on the government side. Um, you had Neil Antirushelvan, a brilliant Tamil, one of the most brilliant brains in, in Sri Lanka. He was killed by the Tamil Tigers in 1999. Lakshman Kadugama, the foreign minister, was killed by the Tamil Tigers. And I can mention a huge number of others. So, of course, a complete generation of people involved in the peace process, they were on the Tiger side, all killed. On the government side, many killed. And it made, of course, a very strong impression. How do you survive? I think I survived by the fact that I believe that at every point I did what I could, I did my utmost. Uh, I was never lazy. I was never saying that I can't do this because I don't have time, I don't want to do it. Uh, we did our utmost as, as I see it at every point. We may have made mistakes for sure. Uh, we, and we should reflect upon how we can do better in a similar situation another time. Uh, but I think what keeps me going is the fact that I, I, I believe I, I did my utmost. Um, so it's so sad, uh, but I did, did what I could. But how this impact upon people is so different. I mean, also some people who have been into much, much worse situations like me. I mean, you have people who were in Auschwitz during the Second World War, even were there for, for years still coming out of that experience with no visible uh, wounds on their psyche. They lived normal, good lives, loving fathers, great workers after the war. And you have people who had very, very slight experiences with war, who later claimed that they, this completely destroyed their life. So my, my take is that people, humans are so different. The, how you experience extreme violence and, and wars is so dif different. Some people came out of it with very slight problems and some people came out even with much less experience with enormous psychological and post-stress uh, post syndrome problems. There's not one rule. People are simply very, very different. Mm -hmm. But we need to help uh, whatever is the situation for the individual. That was a great question, um, Ryan and Eric. We're really, really sort of um, grateful um, for sort of this session. It's been so engaging. Um, so thank you so much um, for taking the time. And I hope that we'll be able to have you again with sort of our students from the MIHA program. Thank you so much. Ne never hesitate to call upon me if I can help uh, in, uh, the, in the future. And if you have some last question, you can send it by mail and I will do my but Absolutely. you have you have great great students that was great questions thank you thank you so much thank you bye bye thank you bye bye thank you very much thank you so much everyone have a good day bye ryan
I'm just going to stop recording. Hello. I'm going to stop recording. Sure.